So John Neal is the CEO of Unipart. John's pretty exceptional in that he started to be the CEO of Unipart when he was 29, when it spun out from British Leyland, and has dedicated his career and his life to the pursuit of UU. And he's going to share with us his secrets of being a CEO. So, hi there, John. <laughs> hi, Steve. Good to see you again. It's good um, to be here. Great. Well, John, there's quite a lot of questions I'd like to ask you. Okay. That cover a sort of a broad range of topics. Um, but I know one of the things that's quite dear to your heart is sustainability. Um, and I think it, clearly it's been a top of a lot of people's agendas recently. Well, could you talk a bit about what sustainability means to you and, and how, in your view, CEOs should be, should be dealing with sustainability? Well, I think you can think about it on various levels. I mean, if we think about it at a global level, uh, climate change is probably the problem that the world is least equipped to deal with and the, the greatest problem facing humanity, if all of the scientists are right. And, and we have no mechanisms for dealing with the scale of the problem in the time scale that's necessary. Uh, it's, you know, it's probably the first time in the history of mankind when everybody's on the same side against a common enemy. But we don't necessarily have the institutions which enable us to move at the pace we need to move at to be certain that we can counter the problems that we're being warned about. And, and, do, and, and in terms of what you think CEOs could be doing. I mean, and, and other CEOs I, I deal with are sort of, some of them see it as a PR exercise, but some of them take it very seriously and they're grappling with how to execute and get the right measures and so on. Well, again, I think you can take it at various levels, but then let's go to the lowest level. Okay. Yeah. And that's about eliminating waste in your processes every day. Because if you eliminate waste, you use less resources, which makes the business more sustainable. But mm -hmm. to do that, you need highly trained, very motivated people. It's not really possible, if you think about it, to make the planet sustainable with poorly trained and poorly educated people. Well-educated people yeah. will find big strategic solutions, but they also find tactical solutions on a daily basis. So one of the keys is to train and inspire people and equip them with the tools and techniques they need to improve the sustainability of the processes which they control. Yeah, okay, no, I agree with that. Um, we have a, qu have a question then, John, is, I mean, people remember think of Unipart initially being part of British Leyland. Yes. You know, a long, long time ago. But since then, you know, you've worked with a lot of the leading uh, global automotive manufacturers and have created a, you know, an international business. What any secrets there in terms of how you think businesses should um, be more effective at becoming not just UK centric, but more international and, and being successful in a global market? Well, I think everybody looks for the magic solution, you know, the silver bullet, and there isn't one. I mean, most success is painful hard work and deliberate practice um, and finding the right business partners and trying to build lifetime relationships based on a shared vision which delivers mutual advantage. And that is really difficult yeah. to do. Um, I think, you know, you have to be able to take the long-term view. And to take the long-term view, a company has to have an ownership structure which is committed to the mission of the company. And unless all, you know, all these ingredients work well together, it's very hard to get long-term sustainable success. Yeah. And, and, you know, you talk about um, a mission for the company. Um, we, we, you know, as you know, I've met about 150 CEOs now, and there seems to be a group of what I call corporate missionaries, which I think you represent a very good example of somebody who's sort of motivated by the potential of what the company could be and sees the value of people and helps lift people. Um, are there any... Uh, do you know why, um, why you... If you agree with that, you know, how have you become a corporate missionary? And do you, do you think... Have you consciously... Do you think that now's the time that we'll see more missionary rather than professional managers at the top of companies? Well, I mean, maybe some of the clues, if what you say is right, is what drives me. I mean, yeah. I wanted a career in business because I thought that would be the most exciting way to spend my life. I wanted to try and get to the top of it because that's how you, you know, that's what being the best is about. It also gives you the opportunity to control your life. And I imagine many other people want that. And the best way to get control of your life 
is to be well trained, to be well educated, um, because that gives you options and opportunities. And that was part of, not exclusively, but part of the motivation for building the Unipart U, our company university, which has a very clear mission, which is to develop, train, and inspire people to achieve world class performance. Yeah. And, and, and another lot of conversation I had with CEOs, they mentioned about struggling with the command and control style way of working that they traditionally had. Um, how easy is it to move from a command and control to a missionary style of management? If you can create a vision that people can believe in and you can articulate it clearly in an organization, and you can harness the energy of everybody in that organization behind the purpose of the, the company, you will be massively more successful than if you try and create some sort of command and control yeah. structure. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, could you talk a bit more about what you've done at Unipart, particularly the, the, you know, for those people who haven't heard about it, about the Unipart way? You know, it was fantastic when we came down to see you. I just got a real sense of it. But perhaps could you bring that to life a bit? Well, the first thing is to put it in a strategic context. Yeah. I mean, I came to the view that there are only three enduring sources of competitive advantage. Operational excellence, product innovation, and customer intimacy. And there are almost no organizations that can do all three exceptionally. So we chose to start with operational excellence. And that means creating a comprehensive body of knowledge and tools and techniques which enable people to perform to the highest operational standards. But that's just the first step. Yeah. The tools and techniques are the obvious manifestation. The most important is the way people think, is providing people with a body of knowledge, an opportunity to practice those tools and techniques in a world-class operating environment, to learn how to become very good, and then change the way they think. And, you know, you've had a tremendous journey with Unipart over 30 years, and you look very young on it, if you don't want to say. <laughs> <laughs> but, but w I mean, wasn't it temp one thing that struck me when I, when I, when I met you was, was why you stayed at Unipart, you know, because you must have other opportunities to run potentially bigger businesses in terms of scale and maybe bigger challenges. W w what was the glue? W w why, did you why have you stayed? Well, you're right. In the early days, I think I was probably getting a job offer about once a month. Mm. But Unipart gave me the opportunity to do something I might not have been able to do anywhere else. A huge amount of freedom yeah. to build a brand at a time when no one else was doing things like that. Um, an industry that was very exciting to work in and people I liked working with because once you get past the point of making a reasonable salary, yeah. what becomes important is not how many noughts there are on the turnover or how many noughts there are behind the number of people you employ, but whether the people you work with every day are stimulating to work with, whether the job you do is fulfilling, whether when people see you and they talk about your business, they say, that's a great company or that's a great business or I like what you do and not mm. feeling that you have to apologize for the products you sell yeah. or the behavior of your company. Okay. And, 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 and you know, in terms of binding together a company over a long time and keeping the, um, moment, you know, keeping the momentum and the enthusiasm and the energy, is, is, is that the key to it or are there other things as well? I, I think you have to constantly innovate yeah. and find things that resonate with people. But being slightly ahead of the game, it's, mm. it's slightly lonely. At at, at a certain point, and then make sure the organization <laughs> catches up with you. Yeah. So we've done lots of things that have been at the, the forefront of business, of good business practice. I mean, things like yeah. the way we did our buyout involving all of our employees through and communicating it through a theatrical show, which had never been done before. Um, the way in which we built the company university the things we're doing now with the Gate to Great program, which provides 10,000 people with the chance